All right, horizontal demo notes part two. So let's look at some of the other stations and tie in some other concepts. So the other three stations we did, the marble and the cut plate, the downy ball, and the vortex. Let's try to figure out what the centripetal forces were um, causing the acceleration, a centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle, which dictated the circular path of those objects. So in the marble and the cut plate, <clears throat> you had this plate, you had this marble. It's got some weight. But because of this lip, the normal force is pushing somewhat on an angle. So the normal force is providing some x component. And that x component is inward towards the center of the circle. So we would say um, the x component of the normal force is providing the centripetal force that's driving the acceleration towards the center of the circle of the ball rolling around the plate. Now with the downy ball, you had this ball and it had a plug here and it was being pulled by a cord but the plug was being held primarily let me get some different colors in here <clears throat> through some friction some static friction between the plug and the rim of the um, downy ball here and so we had FFS providing the centripetal force so normal force centripetal force provided by uh, FFS, so we would say for the case of the downy ball, the centripetal force is the force of static friction, and that's providing the centripetal acceleration of the plug as it gets pulled around in a circle from the downy ball. Now we would say, well, what's providing the centripetal acceleration of the downy ball? Well, that itself is the tension here, but we're looking at two different objects. Remember, the downy ball itself and the plug are separate objects, so um, if you want to think of it that way, that's perfectly fine. Now, the vortex has kind of this channel and the pennies rotating around and around and around, so its centripetal force is primarily being provided also by a normal force that's inward towards the center of the circle. Now, the normal force is not always exactly inward, but it's going to have a main component, kind of like the ball um, going around the plate, in the center-seeking direction. So again, the normal force <clears throat> providing the centripetal force that's causing the centripetal acceleration. So I want to reiterate the point that the centripetal force is a sum of other forces. We haven't created any new forces here. These are all forces you've already learned about. They just happen to be acting um, in a centripetal direction that's causing an object move, to move in a circular path. So centripetal forces just mean forces towards the center of the circular path of an object. Now let's think about the downy ball and tie it in another concept. When you're rotating the ball, so the ball it's being pulled by a string, and if we ignore the plug for a second, the plug is going to have friction holding it, but there is a force of tension that's pulling inward on the ball. Now, you notice that when your hand holds this, like if you're grabbing the ball, what you notice is this tug and pull. So as the ball goes around and the string is pulling inward on the ball, you feel that tug also pulling outward on your hand. And so really, there's a third law pair at work here through the tension. And that is, as the tension pulls inward on the ball, it's pulling outward on your hand. And so you have this system where within the system, these are internal forces. But if I look at just what's happening to the ball, this is providing a centripetal force. If I look at just what's happening to my hand, and as my hand rotates back and forth in a circle, this is providing a centripetal force. But within the system, um, there is no external force. But um, it's an important concept to relate to this uh, uh, topic because uh, depending upon what object you're looking at, you might uh, be able to uh, quantify the centripetal force by looking at um, either sides of this force pair. We're primarily interested in looking at the object on the outside that's going in a circular path uh, due to that tensional force because that's a little easier uh, to quantify at this point. I mean, we're if we take, for example, um, you know, like a roller coaster with a cart or <clears throat> a car that's driving in a circular path, 
um, we're interested in seeing the effect on the car, the effect on the roller coaster cart, um, not the effect on the other bigger part of the system, which is harder to quantify. Like, how is the road moving to the side based upon the car going to the left, the road going to the right? Well, the road's attached to the earth, which is going to be hard to measure that acceleration. Uh, so we're primarily looking at the uh, external objects there. Now, were there any centrifugal forces present um, on the accelerating objects that we saw above in 6? And remember, these are away from the center. Now, here's where um, you get often centrifugal forces referred to as uh, fictitious forces. I want you to think of centrifugal as a direction. Now, in this case, are there any forces outward on the ball or on the plug or on the vort on the penny in the vortex uh, that are pulling it in the outward radial direction? And the answer in these cases are no. Um, but that doesn't mean there can't be any. There will be some scenarios where we have centripetal forces and centrifugal forces uh, counteracting each other. And if the centripetal force is greater, then you will have uh, in a centripetal acceleration and a circular curve. Um, in this case, there's not. But sometimes it feels like there are. Because when you're pulling the ball in a circular path, um, and if you were, so let's, maybe let's put yourself on the ball. Let's say you're riding the Finn Heinsen machine or you're riding uh, the plug on the downy ball. You're going to feel like you're being pulled outward. Just like if you're driving in a car and you're not paying attention, let's say you're in a passenger seat and the car abruptly turns to the left. You feel as if you're getting tossed into the door. Well, you're not getting tossed into the door. There's no force pushing you in the centrifugal direction. But what happens is the car is moving in the centripetal direction. And until some force pulls you along with that car in the centripetal direction, you're going to keep going straight. Your inertia, inertia will keep you moving in a straight line path. So if we take the downy ball as an example and we spin it around in a circle, so it's moving in this direction but being pulled inward. Now it's moving in this direction but it's being pulled inward. So if you're riding on the ball, you feel like you're flying outward, right? Like you would feel like you're being tossed out to the side, but that's not actually happening. You're just moving in a straight line at a constant speed, and then the next moment you're getting pulled inward. Then you're moving at a straight line at a constant speed and constantly being pulled inward due to the centripetal force. So there's the appearance of a force. This is supposed to be tangential. I'm sorry. It's pretty lazy, sloppy. So there's the appearance of a force pushing you outward when really all that's happening is you're moving in a straight line and the object's pulling inward on you making you feel like you're going outward. Now one way we can pr prove there's no centrifugal forces is if at some point I cut the string. We can look at the direction the object travels and as soon as I cut the string what we'll see is that downy ball travels in a straight line at a constant speed based upon Newton's first law until some other external force accelerates it. And so because of that, it's, it's not flying out to the side, um, but it's actually going to just con continue its tangential path until some other force comes along. So this is a good um, kind of reiteration of what you saw with the marble and the cut plate, where as the marble went around the plate, and it was cut here, right? It's rolling, it's got a centripetal force, centripetal force, pulling it in its circular path, and all of a sudden that's gone, and then it goes and it travels in a straight line at a constant speed. So this is an example of first law, and it's an example of why there are not, not necessarily centrifugal forces acting on an object in circular motion, even though it might appear that there are, or it might feel like you're being pulled outward if you're riding on the Finn Heights machine, or if you're driving in a car, which is maybe a better example. All right, in this last piece here, let's quantify how we apply Newton's second law. So we introduced this for a little bit in the last video, but let's just take the marble rolling around the cut plate. And let's say I wanted to find, uh, for example, the normal force. Like, what's the magnitude of the normal force acting on the marble? This is a dynamics problem, just like the ones we did first semester. The only thing that's different is that now we can, we can recognize that as the marble moves around the plate, it's moving in a circular path. So it must have some force inwards 
towards the center of the circle, uh, providing that centripetal acceleration. Okay, so there must be some centripetal force providing a centripetal acceleration. Now, there are also forces in other directions, right? So if we look at the cross-sectional view of the marble, um, it's going to have a weight, the force of gravity, um, and it's going to have some y component of the normal force that's counteracting the force of gravity. But because of this lip, the normal force itself isn't acting just in the y direction. It also has some x component, n sub x, that's acting inwards towards the center of the circle. So when we solve a problem like this, we're going to apply draw a free body diagram, which we did, same as we've done in all dynamics, and then we're going to apply Newton's second law. And what we can say is, now we're going to treat the x direction as the centripetal direction because it's always inwards towards the center of the circle as it moves around uh, the cut plate <clears throat> before it hits, reaches the cut. So let's first say some of the forces y equals mass times the acceleration y. There's no y acceleration, it's just on the horizontal plane of uh, the table and the plate. So these must equal zero. So n sub y minus mg is equal to zero. And we can also say from uh, the geometry of n and nx and ny, right, if we know this angle, uh, we could solve for, or we could express ny as n uh, sine of theta and nx as n cosine of theta, just like we did with um, horizontal and vertical components of forces in the dynamics unit. So we have ny equals mg or n sine of theta. Now in this case theta is the angle of elevation of the normal force relative to the horizontal. You could do it from the vertical and it would flip the cosine and sine. It doesn't matter. The math comes out the same. So here's one equation we could use as part of solving uh, for the normal force. Now the other one would come from looking at the x direction, which in this case is providing a centripetal force because it's moving in a circular path. So I would say the sum of the forces in the x are the sum of the forces in the centripetal direction, which is going to equal the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So that force is causing the direction of the velocity to change. And we can quantify that as n sub x is equal to m times v squared over r. So based on the curvature and speed of the marble, the curvature of the plate and speed of the marble, um, this is going to be the acceleration that changes the direction of the velocity. And that's always going to be v squared over r. We proved that in the other video. So this becomes n cosine of theta equals mv squared over r. And now you have a system of two equations that you can solve for.